Inner city bus travel in the U.S. has long been dominated by one iconic brand. With its fleet of 1,200 buses, Greyhound shuttles nearly 16 million passengers annually to roughly 2,400 North American destinations. While the company caters to budget-conscious, long-distance travelers, it also offers charter services for businesses, conventions, and schools. In addition, its Greyhound Package Express business provides same and next-day delivery service to thousands of destinations. But competition from low-cost airlines and a combination of increased automobile access and low fuel prices have led to mounting headwinds for the bus operator. The pandemic has also caused passenger demand to plummet. In its fiscal year 2021, Greyhound saw an average of just 10,000 passenger journeys per day, compared with 40,000 during the previous period. The company reported an operating loss of $12 million in fiscal year 2021, and an operating loss of $15 million the year earlier. And it's not just inner city bus lines like Greyhound that are hurting. The motor coach industry, which includes charter, sightseeing, and commuter services, has suffered unprecedented economic losses as a result of the pandemic. A motor coach is generally defined as a long distance passenger vehicle, at least 30 feet in length, with a capacity of more than 30 passengers. The pandemic has hit the, the bus and motor coach industry really harder, I think, than almost any other segment. Right now, everybody's asking, what's post-pandemic travel going to be like? We're encouraged by what we're seeing in the last few weeks, but we do know that with Greyhound, there's sort of an image issue that a lot of people just won't contemplate jumping on a Greyhound because they see it as the mode only to be taken when you've exhausted all your other options. Since the start of COVID, more than a quarter of the motor coach industry has gone out of business, including about 800 small, mostly family-owned operations. According to the American Bus Association, as of July 2021, the bus industry was operating at only about 50% capacity. Greyhound provides an affordable travel option for many people, including those living in rural areas and others with limited economic resources. So what does the future look like for the bus operator? And what happens to inner city bus service in America once the pandemic ends? Greyhound got its start in the mining town of Hibbing, Minnesota in 1914. Swedish immigrant and struggling car salesman Carl Eric Wickman came up with the idea of transporting miners to work in a seven-passenger hutmobile for 15 cents a ride. Expanding rapidly, by 1917 the operation had a fleet of 14 buses and by 1929 renamed itself Greyhound Corporation using the image of a running dog as its symbol. Inner city bus travel was in its infancy following World War I as the number of fully paved roads across the country grew. Inner city bus service, fascinating industry because in the 1920s it grew so rapidly and brought inexpensive travel, you know, less expensive than train travel by a considerable margin to a huge share of the United States. And uh, every small town had a couple bus lines taking uh, people to the nearest city or long distance routes, uh, taking them across the region. A 1930s film starring Clark Gable and featuring a Greyhound bus drew nationwide attention to cross-country bus travel. And by the beginning of the 1940s, Greyhound had a fleet of 4,000 buses. We often think of the 50s and 60s as kind of the, the glory years of inner city bus travel where Greyhound was buying modern scenic cruiser buses. We had new express services going across the country and a remarkable network. By 1969, Greyhound carried almost 92 million passengers, but the bus industry hit a major speed bump in the 70s. The opening of the interstate highway system a decade and a half earlier meant private cars could now easily travel longer distances faster avoiding dangerous back highways and endless stoplights. Secondly, the inner cities of large metropolitan areas really started to decline and bus stations started to be seen as unsafe. People started to see it as a mode of last resort. In 1987, Greyhound bought financially troubled rival Trailways and in 1990 faced a walkout as a majority of the company's 6,300 bus drivers went on strike over wages and job security. A few months later, the company filed for bankruptcy protection. Airline deregulation also led to some passenger defection to budget carriers. But by the mid-2000s, intercity bus travel was seeing something of a resurgence. Starting in 2006, we saw a really nice recovery in this industry, and intercity bus came back in many ways. And it still had tremendous reliance on households without cars, lower income groups that couldn't afford a car, or families that just had one car and a lot of drivers, the bus would be like a, a second car. 
In 2007, First Group, a bus and rail operator out of the UK, bought Greyhound for $3.6 billion and went about modernizing the fleet as well as terminals. The company launched Bolt Bus in 2008 with fares as low as a dollar and Greyhound Express in 2010, featuring new buses with extra legroom. The U.S. motor coach industry is a $15 billion business and includes segments like charter services, commuter services, and scheduled services like Coach USA, the operator of Megabus, and of course, Greyhound. Prior to the pandemic, there were almost 3,000 motor coach companies in the U.S. and Canada. And while a few large national companies provided the vast majority of passenger trips, about 94% of motor coach companies were small and operated fewer than 25 motor coaches. You know, as of a few years ago, we were moving 600 million passenger trips every single year. That's almost as many as the airlines, where airlines at the time were moving about 700 million passenger trips. In 2017, the industry provided 574 million trips for passengers. Small companies accounted for 47.4% of motor coach mileage. Mid-sized companies that operate between 25 to 99 vehicles accounted for 26.8% of that mileage. And large companies that operate over 100 motor coaches accounted for the remainder. With the pandemic causing Americans to be fearful of traveling in groups, the industry has been decimated. So when I look at the commuter segment, you know, those companies are still operating even today at somewhere around 20% capacity, if that, because people are not moving out of some of the in and out of the big cities. In its financial year ending in March 2021, revenue at Greyhound was $422 million, down almost 45% from that same period in 2020 and down more than 50% from 2019 levels. In fiscal year 2021, Greyhound saw 55.5% of its revenue from passenger services, less than half a percent from charter services and private hires, and 44% from other sources of revenue like Greyhound Package Express. In an effort to cut costs, the bus operator sold 15 locations, including a garage and terminal in the downtown Arts District of Los Angeles, and made reductions to its staff, 67% of which were corporate employees. It also substantially reduced capacity on the majority of its routes. That led to a few key improvements in the Greyhound network. On-time performance surged from 76% in 2018 to 90% in fiscal year 2021. And with the company removing about 600 mostly older buses from service, the average fleet age jumped from almost 10 years in 2017 to 5.3 years in 2021. Despite those modest improvements, the past two years have been a challenging time for inner city bus travelers. Starting about 2015, real difficulties began. Fuel prices plummeted and with that airfares came down. You've noticed when you book air travel, a lot of bargains out there on, on Southwest and Spirit. And so all those longer trips were lost. So we had downward momentum and then the pandemic hit. People felt even more wary of bus stations than they would have say of airports because it was a very public setting. It also prompted Greyhound's parent company, First Group, to look for ways to exit the US bus market. In April, 2021, First Group entered an agreement to sell two of its U.S. bus divisions, including First Student, that operates 43,000 yellow school buses and charter services across 40 states. The group has also put Greyhound up for sale, calling the inner city bus line a non-core part of its business. In an email to CNBC, Greyhound said COVID-19 has presented a unique challenge and has given the company the opportunity to focus on what it does best, provide safe, reliable, value-driven transportation for the communities it serves. In many rural areas, inner-city buses, including Greyhound, are the only alternative travel option to a private car. Hundreds and hundreds of cities around the country, the only way to get to that town without a car is to take the bus. Uh, you know, little little places of 500 to 5,000 people, the bus comes once or twice a day, and it takes you to a bigger city where you can connect uh, to other places. And you, you look at the segments that rely on that service, and there often is no plan B. It has also been a lifeline for many during recent public emergencies. During the Oregon wildfires in the fall of 2020, Greyhound spent three days evacuating more than 1,500 residents to safe locations. Early in the pandemic, the company also provided more than 660 free tickets to nurses, firefighters, and pharmacists. In an email to CNBC, Greyhound said it provides transportation to over a thousand communities not served by other bus or rail providers. Passengers rely on its network for activities ranging from seeking employment to accessing medical care. But in recent years, the company has made a push to cut back on some of its more unprofitable routes. In 2018, Greyhound withdrew from Western Canada. Three years later, Greyhound service was suspended across all of Canada and discontinued entirely in 2021. 
scheduled operators have, have got to, at the end of the day, be able to serve their customers and serve the, the bulk of their customers. And so where it hasn't made sense over the years, not just recently, but to make changes in schedules, to potentially drop lines or drop routes because they're, they're not only are they not profitable, they're, you know, they're significant losers to the system and, and, and are a drag on the system. You know, that's where we see changes. It also announced that same year, it was indefinitely shutting down Bolt Bus, known for its dollar fares and free Wi-Fi. So what does the future look like for Greyhound and the inner city bus industry in the U.S.? According to analysts, one trend we are likely to see on more popular routes is buses that offer an upscale experience. Over the last number of years, we saw companies step up and say, well, you know, the customer wants more room, more space. And so they began to change, you know, the look of their bus in the interior and took the same vehicle basically and said, well, instead of having two and two seats across, we're going to have one and two seats, make them bigger seats, more luxury seats, more leg space. To compete with new entrants into the space, like Flixbus, a European-based company that launched in the U.S. in 2018, Greyhound made investments in its website, mobile app, and customer call center. It has also rolled out a new onboard entertainment platform across its U.S. fleet. According to Greyhound, its inner-city bus model could also face some tailwinds going forward, including private car usage becoming less attractive due to increased urbanization. Its underutilized routes may see some funding by transportation authorities, and environmentally, it is a better option than other forms of transportation. Compared to air travel, trains and van pools, motor coaches produce the lowest amount of CO2 emissions per passenger mile and use the least amount of energy, according to the industry. Greyhound said its emission rate per passenger kilometer is 33.6 grams CO2 equivalent, 81% lower than the average US passenger car, and 87% lower than a domestic passenger plane. But despite those issues, industry analysts think it could be years before the bus industry recovers. And even then, Greyhound will have some work to do to repair its image. I think Greyhound's done a, a pretty good job keeping the service standard pretty high. They're rolling out different amenities and bus tracker software and uh, upping their stations. But a long way to go to get the mainstream traveler to, to think about taking that Greyhound when that flight's too expensive. Travel is coming back. Airlines are obviously busy. Airports are jammed, as, as, as I noticed the other day when I flew to the meeting I'm at today. Restaurants are busy. Hotels are busy in different destinations. But it really hasn't gotten to the motor coach industry yet. And I don't think we're going to see full recovery uh, or whatever the new normal is be full recovery until probably sometime in 2023.